Saturday, September 19th, 1992. Two men are jogging here in the Balanglo State Forest, about two hours' drive south of Sydney. A terrible smell stops them in their tracks. Oh, my God, what's that? It's the smell of death. They find the decomposing body of a young woman. She's been stabbed 14 times in a murderous frenzy. And there are more bodies lying in this lonely forest. They're the victims of Australia's most cruel and vicious serial killer. A monster who murdered for his own sick gratification. In the late 80s and early 90s, Australia is a mecca for backpackers. They're young, adventurous and out to see the world on a shoestring. In just a few years, a billion-dollar industry springs up from nothing. Specialist hostels offer no-frills accommodation for young travellers. Here, they can meet other backpackers from all over the world, share their experiences and plan new adventures. In late 1991, two young British women, Joanne Walters and Carolyn Clark, meet at a King's Cross backpackers hostel and become instant friends. Joanne, born on Australia Day, January 26, 1970, in Maesteg, Wales, is a bright and sociable young woman who gets the travel bug early in life, as her father Ray recalls. Yeah, she was uh, very outgoing. The nature of the job she was doing, she trained as a nanny as well, and that's uh, left a, a scope to sort of travel other countries, looking after children in different parts of the world. And uh, I think it would have been hard for her to settle down after it because uh, she just loved travelling. Caroline from England. Antonella from Italy. <laughs> Carolyn Clark is a 21-year-old from Surrey in England. She's strong-willed with a devil-may-care attitude to life. Some say she can be a little sharp-tongued at times and from an early age, she has a fascination with Australia. I think quite quite early on, um, probably from the age of about 10 or so, um, we'd always sit down in holiday times, they would always sit down and watch the, the Australian soaps, you know, Neighbours, Home and Away, that sort of thing, and um, gradually sort of took hold, didn't mm. it, the, yes. the, the goal of getting to Australia, so, um, and we certainly didn't discourage it, I think travel is fantastic for youngsters. Carolyn's dream comes true when she arrives in Sydney on September the 19th, 1991. In February, Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters head to the Riverina town of Mildura to pick grapes for two months. Then, on to Tasmania. Here, Caroline swaps her small, shabby tent for a blue three-man tent owned by a fellow traveller, Steve Wright. Steve has accidentally torn a hole in the tent with his fruit picking knife and has patched it together with address labels he made on a computer. Joanne and Carolyn return to Sydney for a few days before leaving on the morning of April the 18th, 1992, Easter Saturday, to hitchhike around Australia. They take the train to Kasula Station in Sydney's southwest with plans to then hitch a ride to Melbourne and onto the Great Ocean Road and beyond. Then, Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters disappear. We can't be certain what happened next, but based on evidence and police reports, what you're about to see is the surreal nightmare that unfolds for Joanne and Carolyn. It's believed that they accept a ride from a man in a four-wheel drive vehicle. As the four-wheel drive cruises south along the highway, country music playing on the car stereo system, the two English girls find this fit, muscular, rugged-looking Aussie bloke intriguing, even a little charming. So how long have you been in Australia? 
He asks them all sorts of questions, but after a time, something changes. The man, who calls himself Bill, becomes quiet and sullen. Joanne and Carolyn aren't sure why. Was it something they said? All they know is that Bill is now more sinister, more menacing. He stops the four-wheel drive, makes an excuse to get out of the vehicle. I just want to grab a cassette from under the seat. I can't go driving without music. And then he pulls a gun. All right, we're just going to have a little bit of a game, all right? We're just... Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Get out of the corner! Wipe your head off! You hear me? Don't get out! He says he's going to rob the women. If they cooperate, he won't harm them. He produces restraining ties and tells Joanne to tie Carolyn up. Hold your hands up! Hold your hands up! Cross up! Clear up! Now! Then he ties Joanne up. You don't want to die here. We've got a couple of hours of fun to have yet. <laughs> As he pulls back onto the highway, the assailant is in complete control, and the women are terrified. Calm down. There's nothing to be scared of. He tries to calm them. All right? Just going to play a couple of games, and I'll let you go. Right? Unharmed. Just past the town of Berrima, he turns right off the highway into Bunny Galore Road. Carolyn and Joanne are being taken deeper and deeper into the remote, rugged bushland of Belanglo State Forest. Stay in the car! The women are taken out of the vehicle and into the bush. Get out of the car! Get out of the car! Walk! Move it! Move it, you bitch! Bill now says to Joanne and Carolyn that he wants to have sex with them. No, 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 no. I'm just gonna, look, I'm just gonna take a look. See, see, I'm not, I'm not here to hurt you, okay? He frees Carolyn's arms and allows her to smoke. There you go, see, I told you. Yeah. She nervously yeah, gets through six cigarettes as Bill sits watching, talking, trying to keep the young women calm and under his control. <laughs> After what seems like an eternity, the time for talking is over. <laughs> Carolyn is forced to her knees. A maroon-coloured sloppy Joe is wrapped around her head. The killer shoots her once in the head, killing her instantly. Joanne screams in horror. Shut up, you no, bitch. Bill gags her and then returns to Carolyn. Shut up. He casually repositions her head and shoots once more. He acts out the same ritual again and again, firing a single shot, repositioning Carolyn's head and shooting again. It's a barbaric slaughter perpetrated coldly and calmly. After shooting Carolyn ten times, the murderer stabs her once in the back as a final act of savagery. <laughs> Joanne Walters is dragged away. There's a brief struggle, but Joanne is quickly subdued. 30 metres from where Carolyn's body lies, a hunting knife plunges into Joanne's spine paralyzing her. Her jeans are pulled down. Her panties are cut off. She is raped. But this is not about sex. This is about power and control. Then, in a frenzied attack, she is stabbed again and again, the killer still hacking at her body after she's dead. When it's over, the bodies of Joanne and Carolyn are crudely concealed with twigs and leaf litter before the killer leaves the scene.
Weeks go by, and with no word from Joanne and Carolyn, their parents begin to fear the worst. When we didn't hear from Joanne, and we knew when Father Daddy came, and I hadn't received anything, we knew something was wrong, because that wasn't Joanne. She always remembered birthdays, and it was important to her. And we were down with friends in Cornwall, and on our way back, we got a call uh, from Ray Walters saying, we haven't heard from Joanne, we're getting worried, have you heard? And I think that's when um, the alarm bells really started to ring very loud. On September 19th, 1992, five months after Joanne Walters and Carolyn Clark are murdered, two orienteers make a gruesome discovery. It's a human body, roughly concealed beneath a rock ledge. Local police are contacted and they attend the scene. The body is identified as being that of Joanne Walters. The following day, the remains of Carolyn Clark are found nearby. There are personal effects, such as coins and jewelry at the scene, but oddly, there's no sign of Joanne or Carolyn's camping gear. Joanne Walters' parents, Ray and Jill, had come to Australia after their daughter went missing. As Ray recalls, they're taking time off to visit the Sydney Opera House when the tragic news reaches them. And then next thing, two police cars come outside the Opera House and they said they'd found what they thought was Joanne's body. They'd um, tried to put her in the car and Jill was so upset she was trying to get out the other side. So, uh, it's a terrible experience. Well, I suppose you don't want to believe it, but you do. You have to. She can't give any further description of the clothing or anything. Just a murder investigation swings into action. Detective Inspector Bob Godden is in charge. Oh, we set up an uh, investigation post at uh, Barrel Police Station and uh, we started to get information and we started to carry out an investigation. Bob Godden takes Ray and Jill Walters to the forest. It was very difficult. They, uh, they wanted to come down and view the scene. Uh, I took them out to the forest and uh, it was very, very emotional. Inspector Godden brings renowned forensic psychiatrist Dr Rod Milton to the crime scene. As I recollect it, it didn't change over time, but I, I thought it was a person who was used to that kind of thing, who was very deliberate in uh, uh, expression of aggression, but who contained aggression, so that he was a kind of person that, uh, if you like, have an iron fist and a velvet glove, but who would enjoy uh, then exercising the iron fist and seeing people suffer and uh, then do so over a period of time in a very deliberate way. Investigators begin to compile a list of people who might fit the profile. A police ballistics expert, Sergeant Gerard Dutton, examines the bullets and cartridge cases found with Carolyn Clark's body. We found that Carolyn had been shot 10 times in the head uh, with a small caliber firearm and uh, Interestingly enough, these shots came from three different directions, basically the, the left side, the right side and the rear. During the post-mortem examination, we recovered seven spent 22 caliber bullets from, her, from inside her skull cavity. My next sort of involvement was going back down to the scene where she was found and examining that area. And it was during that examination that we found uh, another three bullets uh, in the soil underneath where her head had lain, which had actually passed through her head. And with a metal detector, we, we made quite a large search of the area surrounding both bodies, and only several metres from where Clark's body was lying were 10 22 calibre fired cartridge cases. Sergeant Dutton is able to identify the type of weapon used to kill Carolyn Clark. My uh, laboratory investigations revealed that uh, one gun had been used and that, that it was, as far as I could determine, a, a Ruger Model 1022 self-loading rifle. What I also found in relation to the bullets that were recovered from her head and, and at the scene was that there was a very unusual gouge mark on some of these bullets. They were very typical of being caused by a misaligned baffle in a silencer. 
as the bullet passes through the silencer, so the side of the bullet scrapes up against it and it removes some of the lead in, and that's what I was seeing in this particular case. So the murder weapon is a Ruger 1022, almost certainly with a silencer fitted. But this is the only positive lead so far, and there are something like 55,000 of these weapons throughout Australia. With so little to go on, investigators have serious doubts that the murders will ever be solved. Then, more than a year after the first bodies of Joanne Walters and Carolyn Clark are found, a local man makes a gruesome discovery in Belanglo Forest. It's the skull of a young Melbourne woman, Deborah Everest, who's been missing since 1989, almost three years earlier. James Gibson and Deborah Everest are friends, both living in Melbourne. James is a slightly built young man. His trademark black hat covers long hair pulled back into a ponytail. A freewheeling spirit, he seems an odd match with his friend, Deborah Everest. She's much more orthodox, and she's no fan of the alternative lifestyle. In the summer of 1989, James is keen to go to Sydney and then back to the border town of Albury for an alternative culture festival. He asks Deborah to go with him. At first, she's not keen, but eventually, after encouragement from her mum, Pat, she agrees to go. This was the first time she had been away from home. Her father had been sick and she had been helping me a lot. And she said, oh, mum, if you really don't want me to go, I won't go. And I said, oh, the break will do you good. On December the 28th, James and Deborah's parents drop them off at the local railway station. They don't want their kids to hitchhike, but James insists that it's safe as long as they travel as a couple. James takes his credit card and a backpack containing clothing, food, his camera and a notebook. By the time they get to Sydney, their friends have already left for Albury. So James and Deborah stay the night, and then they set out the next morning between 9 and 9.30. They catch a train to Liverpool. It's believed that they then walk along the highway till they reach a small shopping centre at Kasula. A man approaches them and points to his four-wheel drive vehicle. He offers them a lift, and they gratefully accept. They travel south for what seems like an hour or so, and then the vehicle pulls over and stops a few hundred metres north of the turnoff to Belanglo State Forest. Just calm down, calm down, calm down, calm down. Before they know it, James and Deborah are prisoners. We're just going to play a game. They're taken into the forest. James is quickly disabled by a knife wound to his spine, and then he's left as the killer turns his attention to Deborah. A short distance away, Deborah is brutally attacked. A blow from a blunt object smashes her jaw. Her tights, bra and panties are removed, and she's tied up with the tights. She's raped. When the assailant has finished, he repeatedly stabs her. 30 metres away, James, unable to move, is forced to listen to the full horror of Deborah's murder, knowing that his turn is coming soon. And soon enough, his killer is upon him. Uh, you bitches dead. <laughs> now it's your turn. The knife still wet with Deborah's blood, now plunges into James's chest. His body is roughly covered in twigs and leaves, and then the murderer goes home.
The following day, a man riding his bike through Galston Gorge on the northwestern outskirts of Sydney finds a camera, James Gibson's camera. The man thinks nothing more of it. In March 1990, James's backpack is found by the side of Galston Road. Police search the area, but no more clues are unearthed. In fact, there's no trace found of James or Deborah for more than three and a half years. During the agony of those lonely years, Pat Everest clings to the forlorn hope that Deborah may still be alive. You can't, when it's your child, you never give up hope, ever. Despite I, what I believe, perhaps deep down, I never, never gave up hope that I would see her again. It is October 1993, 13 months after the bodies of Joanne Walters and Carolyn Clark were discovered in Belanglo State Forest. Bruce Pryor, a local potter, knows this forest like an old friend, and he takes a keen interest in the progress of the Clark and Walters murder investigation. He spends long hours tramping through Belanglo, using his local knowledge to look for clues. He searches the area for months, then one day in October, Bruce follows a hunch and drives his truck to a little-known fire trail called the Morris Trail. So I get out of the truck, lock the truck, and take my walking stick and head off through the scrub. And within 50 metres, I'd found the come across the, um, the thigh bone lying on the ground. Um, so I picked it up and thought, well, it could be a kangaroo. Um, but there was just the, the head on the femur, and a human is, doesn't have the large webbed um, bony protrusion that a kangaroo does. And I thought, huh, it looks awfully like a human bone. Then I put the bone back down on the ground, and at one point I'm pushing through this sort of pea scrub, and there's a skull on the ground. The remains are those of Deborah Everest. Bruce Pryor reports his grisly find to police. Soon, the area is teeming with investigators. One of them finds a black hat, similar to the one James Gibson was wearing before he disappeared. Then we wandered around to where the detective was indicating something beneath one of the trees and in turn they stood up on a rock and just stared at what just looked like a flat area of ground with a whole heap of twigs and branches lying on it. And eventually I was encouraged, uh, invited to have a look as well and it took me oh, 60, 80 seconds before I realised that what I was looking at underneath the, the leaf litter and the branches was a skeleton. An examination of dental records proves that these are the remains of James Gibson. The forensic pathologist, Dr. Peter Bradhurst, examines the two bodies. He confirms that both died horrifically. And he gives an insight into how the killer disabled James before he raped and murdered Deborah. A stab wound in his spine would have paralyzed him because the, the cut or evidence of the cut into the vertebral column indicated that it it had gone through the vertebral canal and would have severed the spine. It seems highly possible that there's a connection between the murders of James Gibson and Deborah Everest in late 1989 and the killings of Joanne Walters and Carolyn Clark in 1992. And Bruce Pryor, the man who found Deborah Everest's skull, now finds that he's a prime suspect. My initial interview at the police station lasted four hours and you know I was asked if I was involved in the murders of these people, uh, which I, f I found appalling that they would even think of our, would even think that I had any involvement whatsoever in, in uh, their demise. Um, so here I am, I'm sitting there waiting for the slap on the back and saying, you know, I've done a good job and suddenly I realise that I'm actually under investigation. Bruce Pryor will remain high on the list of suspects for several months before he's finally excluded. 
On October the 6th, 1993, Inspector Bruce Couch leads a police search through the forest. We first became involved uh, when the, the Victorian couple were found. And our uh, close-in compressed search of that immediate area and the surrounds, probably uh, uh, 200 metres square, uh, we located some other bone fragments from bodies. And that took a number of days. It had to be specific. And uh, one of the uh, victim's bodies had been disturbed, I believe, by animals. So there were bone parts m moved about. And Superintendent Clive Small, a 30-year veteran with a reputation as an uncompromising, no-nonsense straight shooter, is put in charge of the investigation. On the day that I arrived, it was clear that it was a very remote area, a very rugged area, and one of the problems there were, uh, that existed at that time was that about 12 months earlier, two other bodies had been discovered in the forest, not far from where this third body and the fourth body um, had been located. Uh, in most cases, there was very little uh, of the remains of any of the victims left. They were in exposed conditions. They had been in, those, uh, in the forest for several years. Um, the murders occurred between uh, 1989 and 1992, and we're now talking about 1993. So uh, a lot of the conditions uh, at the crime scenes and in the forest had changed over those years, and evidence that might normally exist at a crime scene was, or had a higher chance of being uh, lost because of the time and the exposure to the elements. On October the 14th, a special task force is established called Task Force Air. Headed by Clive Small, the investigating team is under enormous pressure to get results. The pressure was uh, quite considerable and it was con coming from a number of different perspectives. Uh, what we had again was a media that was trying to jump ahead of the investigation so we had to get some control of that. The pressure on looking after the welfare of the police that were down at this location was a major issue and of course there was a general political pressure that existed when we had stories of um, serial killers running around in the highlands and um, those sorts of reports. John Fay is the Premier of New South Wales and the Belanglo Forest happens to be in the heart of his electorate. So for him, this is personal as well as political. The winner is Cindy. And just one month earlier, he had led Sydney's successful bid for the 2000 Olympic Games, based partly on Australia's reputation as a safe country. And then almost instantly, here was the, a country that had some dark secrets, that was getting publicity all around the world. It seemed so contrary to all that we'd represented as being Australian. And uh, I must say that uh, it made me very apprehensive uh, uh, to, uh, to put this matter to rest. Now a team of 40 police is combing the forest for clues and possibly more bodies. We were aware that there were a number of people missing. Uh, what we certainly couldn't tell at that time was of all the people we had uh, listed as being missing, who of those could be in the forest and who were not relevant to the forest. November the 1st and the worst fears of investigators are realised. Another body is discovered. It's the remains of Simone Schmidl, a young German woman, murdered and left in the forest for more than 21 months. Twenty-year-old Simone Schmidl hails from the town of Regensburg, on the edge of the Bavarian Alps in Germany. Known by the nickname Simi, she's an experienced traveller, She's outgoing and adventurous, and by late 1990, she's made plans to travel to Australia. She purchases a distinctive looking backpack, a sleeping bag, and a band to tie up her sleeping mat. She later buys a green water bottle and writes her nickname, Simi, on it in marker pen. She arrives in Sydney in late September. She rings her father, Herbert, and tells him how friendly everyone's been. Herbert urges his daughter not to accept lifts from strangers. 
Simi promises him that she won't. And there's some good news. Simi's mum is arriving in Melbourne in January. She decides to meet her there. At 8.15 on the morning of January the 20th, Simone Schmidl sets out for Melbourne. She wears a purple headband to hold back her hair. The trains aren't running today, so she takes a bus to Liverpool and then begins walking towards Kasula. A local Liverpool woman sees a young girl with a shock of dark brown hair and a huge backpack walking along the highway beyond Liverpool station. A short time later, the woman glances again and the girl is gone. In that brief interlude, Simi has accepted a lift. Thank you, Rod. I'd love one, actually. Oh. You look like you the need man a with the four-wheel drive is charming and helpful. As they drive south past Mittagong, the driver becomes more aggressive. He launches into an anti-Asian diatribe. Then, without warning, he pulls over and pulls a gun. Okay, wait. Ah! Calm down! Calm down! Calm down! You yell again, no play it up! Calm down! Simi is helpless. You gonna stay calm? The man quickly gains calm? complete control binding the terrified young woman with an elaborate wire and rope restraining device. Stay nice and calm. Okay. At the same time, he tries to reassure her that she'll come to no harm if she just gives him what he wants. You calm? Feeling good? Good. The vehicle turns into Belanglo State Forest. Simone is gagged and taken into the bush. There's no possibility for her to escape or defend herself. Suddenly, a knife plunges upwards into her spine, instantly paralyzing her. Now, this predator can take all the time he wants. Only one person, the killer, knows how long this innocent young woman is made to suffer. But finally, her terrible ordeal ends with four horrendous knife blows. Ready? The murderer takes a few moments to survey his handiwork. Then he covers the body of Simone Schmidl in leaf litter and twigs and walks away. Monday, November the 1st, 1993. The police search team of 40 has now scoured an area of 22 square kilometres. The search is close to being called off. Then they find the remains of Simone Schmidl. In Regensburg, Simone's father, Herbert Schmidl, a bus driver, is working when a relief driver is sent out to meet him. Then his wife arrives with tragic news. And as I got into her car, she informed me that they had announced on the radio that Simone's body had been found. To me, that was unbelievable. And I started shaking all over. Detectives in Barrel recognize Simone's purple headband from photographs in their missing persons file. She's dressed in the clothes she was wearing when she was last seen. But her backpack and camping gear are nowhere to be found. Clive Small is attending a conference in Sydney when he's notified that a fifth body has been found. He suspects that it won't be the last. By the time we got to the discovery of the fifth body, um, based on the records that were available and what we had at the time, we suspected that there were probably another two. The search team under Inspector Bruce Couch is dramatically increased. Well, initially it started with 40, uh, plus myself and, uh, and uh, my deputy, and it escalated, uh, I guess at the end of the day, between 250 and 300 police, uh, which is a huge logistical exercise. 
Police walk shoulder to shoulder through the forest or crawl on hands and knees, searching for the most minute of clues. Then, on November the 4th, the bleak forest gives up another of its dark secrets, and the body count rises again. Gabor Neugebauer is a strong, fit young man from Germany. During compulsory military training in Munich, he meets Anja Hapschied, a pretty girl with long reddish-brown hair. They're both shy and reserved by nature, and they make a perfect couple. They love to travel together. After backpacking through Europe and around Asia, they arrive in Sydney in time for Christmas 1991. Their parents are relieved when they hear that Gabor and Anya are in Australia. They feel it's a safer place to travel than some parts of Asia they've been visiting. They leave their King's Cross hostel on the morning of Boxing Day, December the 26th. It seems likely that they follow what's become the backpacker routine, a train to Liverpool, and then a walk to Kasula, and hopefully a lift south. At Kasula, Gabor and Anya have some luck, and it's all bad. The friendly Aussie bloke with the four-wheel drive takes them south. Then, without warning, he turns on them. OK, we're just going to have a little go. Put your hands down. We're Gabor down. resists, okay, right. but the we're man fires a warning shot. Get up, you piece of shit! Don't you ever grab this gun again! Or the next hole will be through your head. The bullet thuds into the passenger side door. Get your hands back! Tie him up! No. Gabor is strong. Oh, but he's bound fast and he's reluctant to act rashly in case he puts his girlfriend's yeah. life at even greater risk. Tie him up! And besides, this man has said he'll let them go in a little while. Now calm down. We're going to enjoy the time, all right? But soon, the kidnapper's intentions are clear. Anya struggles to get away, but to no avail. Where do you think you're going, bitch? Gabor goes to Anya's defence, but he's bashed unconscious. He is shot six times in the head. <laughs> Anya knows that she too is doomed. <laughs> She's dragged away. Later, we don't know how much later, a macabre ritual is played out. The young German woman is forced to kneel with her head bowed. Then she is, in effect, executed, decapitated with brutish force. The bodies are dragged to their final resting places, 55 meters apart. A money belt containing currency, airline tickets and traveller's checks is left 60 metres from Gabor's body and 20 metres from that deadly restraining device. Anya's jeans are left more than 150 metres away, along with drink bottles, rope and empty bullet boxes. Serial numbers on these bullet boxes will ultimately be used to help track down the backpacker murderer. November 1993. So far, the bodies of five young travellers have been found in the Belanglo State Forest, a two-hour drive south of Sydney along the Hume Highway. James Gibson and Deborah Everest from Melbourne, Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters from the UK, and Simone Schmidl from Germany. All have been savagely murdered. Some shot, some stabbed, some sexually violated. Then, on November the 4th, 
The bodies of the young German backpackers, Gabor Neugebauer and Anja Hapschied are discovered, and the murder count rises to seven. Um, by the time we had discovered the seventh body, um, it was clear, in our minds at least at that stage, that we had one person responsible for all the murders. We had a lot of common features that were emerging, and I think it was fair to say uh, at that time it was, an, it was an appropriate time to declare or express the view that we had a serial killer, and I did that. In Germany, Gabor Neugebauer's parents, Manfred and Anka, are informed that their son's body has been found. Bob Gordon huh, told us. But before uh, journalists uh, are uh, calling every morning at six o'clock and told us they have found a boy or a skeleton with, with a hat, and so it must be your son. And after an exhaustive search of the murder scene, ballistics expert Sergeant Gerard Dutton has some useful evidence to examine. We found a number of Winchester cartridge cases and a number of Ely brand cartridge cases as well as bullet damage to trees and other things. And this was quite exciting because once I'd had an opportunity to examine these cartridge cases, I was able to establish that the Winchester cartridge cases had all been fired in the same weapon that was used to kill Carolyn Clark. And now uh, we had a definitive link between two of these murder scenes. Did he say where he was? On November the 9th, a toll free hotline is set up. The response is so overwhelming that a sophisticated new computer system has to be devised in order to handle the avalanche of information from the public. At this early stage, there are numerous persons of interest, but there's one local family name that keeps cropping up. The name is Malat. A number of people uh, mentioned the Malat family as being suspects for the murders. The reasons that were given were very general, but they included things like they, they were locals who had an intimate knowledge of the uh, forest. They, a number of the brothers were um, very much into guns and were described as being gun freaks. A number were in fact members of gun clubs. They had, the family had had some run-ins with the police. They were, they were seen as um, loners who lived by themselves, who looked after one another, who didn't interact with the community or police. And I think it was that sort of, um, what I might regard in American terms as sort of being hillbillies, in a sense, um, that drew attention to them. Police receive a phone call about a man calling himself Paul Miller, oh, okay. who's been known to make strange well, and menacing pretty. statements to his workmates. Before any bodies have been found in Belanglo Forest, he says, I know who killed those Germans. And later he says, there are more bodies out there, they still haven't found them all. Inquiries reveal that Paul Miller is actually Richard Malat. A short time later, a barrel detective visits the local pistol club, following up the list of Ruger 22 gun owners who might be suspects. He's approached by Richard Malat's brother, Alex, a member of the club. Bob Godden recalls his story. Well, Alex came forward and made a statement that he was driving along uh, the road there that leads, uh, uh, heads towards the forest, and he saw uh, two motor vehicles racing down the track into the forest. And he happened to notice that the two girls, one in each of the vehicles, and they were bound and gagged and that there were four men or in each of the vehicles, I think it was. Um, but we were a little bit sceptic about it because of the way that he told it, and he must have had tremendous observational powers to see what he, he said he did. I don't know whether he was actually trying to put us onto a, um, a line of inquiry into the Mlad family, or whether or not he was trying to it was the other way. I just don't know. Alex and Richard Malat are amongst 14 children born to a Yugoslavian immigrant, Stephen Malat, and his wife, Margaret, between 1939 and 1962. Guns figure in the lives of the Malat boys from very early on, as one brother, Boris, recalls. 
I can remember that the guns seemed to nasty there one time. Dad built a big packing shed and we used to play uh, cowboys and Indians with slug guns. Uh, you know, we'd actually shoot at one another. And I was hit a few times, but this time I was, um, Alec being the shot he was, must have got carried away and I put my head up and next thing, bang, he shot me right in the front of the, in the forehead. And uh, Dad seen that and he, oh, he took the guns off and uh, I think if he was alive, he'd still be chasing Alec <laughs> up the paddock. Uh, I'll never forget that. There are 10 Malat brothers. Several of them are in trouble with the law from an early age. One brother, Ivan, is known to be a gun fanatic and he owns a four-wheel drive vehicle. He has a criminal record going back to 1962 when at the age of 17, he was found guilty of theft. In 1971, he's charged with abducting two young women and raping one of them. But at the subsequent trial, the women, both under psychiatric care, are no match for the Malat family's solicitor, John Marsden. Well, the two young women came in and gave evidence and they, quite frankly, stuffed their evidence badly and uh, admitted that it was a consensual act. I never know whether it was or was not, you never know that, but the jury found him not guilty. And that was the beginning and end of it. It was a, a very good win in court from the point of view of a forensic cross-examination of the two victims, or alleged victims. With the Malat family under scrutiny, investigators set out to find the owner of the Ruger 1022 used to kill Carolyn Clark and Gabor Neugebauer. The ammunition boxes found near Gabor's body have batch numbers on them. So police contact the ammunition factory in Victoria where they were manufactured. We sent police down to uh, Melbourne. Uh, they went through the records of the factory and were able to identify that uh, they'd been sold in the year or so prior to the first murder and that uh, they'd been sold to something like about 55 um, gun shops around Australia and about half of those were in New South Wales and a number of them were in um, the Sydney area. One gun shop in Sydney's west is found to have sold bullets from the incriminating batch to a man using the name Ivan. Ivan Mallat works on road gangs for the Roads and Traffic Authority. The work takes him to a variety of locations, including a number of unsolved murder scenes. He was also working in the Galston area, northwest of Sydney, when James Gibson's backpack and camera were left there. And what's more, police inquiries revealed that Malat was not at work when all seven backpackers disappeared. Clive Small has a burgeoning file on Ivan Malat and his brothers, but there are still too many pieces missing. Then a story emerges that will put Ivan squarely in the picture. It's a story that's been buried since shortly after the first murders took place. In late 1989, a young Englishman, Paul Onions, arrives in Sydney with plans to see as much of Australia as he can. On January the 25th, 1990, he sets out for Melbourne, hoping he can hitch a ride at least part of the way. At Kasula, he accepts a lift from a man in a four-wheel drive vehicle. As he settles into the vehicle, Paul, a keen cricket fan, notices that this bloke, Bill, looks a bit like the great Australian fast bowler, Dennis Lilly, with that characteristic long, droopy moustache. Your brothers and sisters, yep. Bill starts to ask Paul Onions questions. Does anyone know you're headed down to Melbourne? You know, you Are you meeting somebody today? tonight? So you're out here all by yourself. That's Drinking. right. Brave. Um, Bill says he lives locally. He's divorced, divorced and his family is originally from uh, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, over your way. But as the afternoon wears on, Bill's mood changes. He becomes withdrawn. Paul can't get a word out of him. But Paul's never hitchhiked before. He doesn't know exactly what to expect. Maybe he's being overly suspicious. Then, south of the town of Berrima, 
Bill says he needs to pull uh, over. We're just about out of radio range, so I'm just going to look for a spot to pull over and grab some tapes. That doesn't make sense. There are tapes right there, between the driver's seat and the passenger's seat. Paul is becoming edgier as Bill finds a place to stop. Mate, I just got to grab those cassettes. I got to have music. Paul gets out to stretch his legs. What are you getting out of the car for? Get back into the car. But Bill turns on him. How do I give you a ride if you're not in the car? Paul looks around oh. to see how much traffic is on the road, just in case he needs to make an escape. Look, I, I got to get these cassettes. Stay in the car, will you? All he right? tries to calm himself down tells himself he's just being paranoid. Right, this is a hold-up. This is a hold-up. Relax, relax. You know what this is? You know what this is? Calm down. Stay in the seat. Don't get out of the seat. Paul Onions isn't being paranoid. This man is going to kill him. What are you doing? What are you doing, you stupid shit? He dives out of the vehicle and runs for his life up the highway. Bill grabs his gun and shoots. A local woman, Joanne Berry, is driving south with her sister and her children, and she comes across the scene. The passenger side guy was trying to wave down a car as if something was terribly wrong, and the second guy tackled him on the road, pushed him onto the medium strip. They seemed to wrestle a bit there. Then the, the first guy got up again and was running onto the road trying to wave down cars, got tackled again got up again, ran, and he stood right in front of my vehicle in the lane. Um, I'd been slowing down because I didn't want to run over anybody. He came up to the driver's side window, said, help me, he's got a gun. I initially said, no, look, I've got all these kids. I can't do anything. Um, somehow I got off the road. The first guy hopped in. I reversed up the side of the road. We sat there and watched as the driver of the four-wheel drive started running back to his car. He looked to be hiding something, you know, like he was, he was running as if he had his arms folded across his chest. He hopped in his vehicle and just drove off. And I then drove up, did a U-turn where I could and drove back to Barrel. A constable takes a statement from Paul Onions here at Barrel Police Station. Another officer calls in a bulletin on the police radio, but there's no real urgency. This seems to be no more than a routine case of attempted robbery. Paul hears nothing further about the incident and eventually returns home to England. The police report is lost. Before that report resurfaces in early 1994, Simone Schmidl, Gabor Neugebauer, Anya Hapschied, Joanne Walters, and Carolyn Clark will lose their lives. November 1993. Paul Onions has been safely back home in England for more than three and a half years since his terrifying encounter with a would-be murderer who called himself Bill. By now, seven bodies have been discovered in Belanglo Forest. Believing that this man Bill might be the backpacker killer, Paul rings the police toll-free hotline in Australia to tell his story. At around the same time, Joanne Berry, the local woman who almost certainly saved Paul's life, also rings the hotline. The police have been bombarded with calls and there is a mountain of evidence to be followed up. With no clear suspect in the picture, Joanne and Paul's statements are not acted upon for another four months. But by early 1994, there is more and more evidence pointing to Ivan Milat. So Task Force Air officers dig deeper and come across the report of Milat's rape charges from 1971. Then, they take another look at the extraordinary story told by Paul Onions and corroborated by Joanne Berry. Some investigators are now convinced that Malat is their man. Clive Small, though, is still being cautious. By around March, 
we had gathered quite a lot of evidence that suggested Malat's involvement, Ivan Malat's involvement in the murders. I wouldn't say it was sufficient to arrest him and charge him with those offences at that time. One of the investigators had spoken to Paul Onions on the telephone. Uh, there were actually several calls uh, to discuss what he could remember about the incident, what he could describe. And based on those telephone calls, we were convinced that he was talking about the um, Belanglo murderer, that uh, his evidence was vital, and that for court purposes, we needed to be careful about how we spoke with him on the phone, and the best approach was to bring him out here, make sure that we did everything formally, made sure it was done correctly and beyond question, and uh, the decision was made to bring him out. Paul Onions arrives back in Australia on May the 2nd and is taken to the area where the attempted kidnapping took place in 1990. It's just 800 metres north of the Belanglo Forest Turnoff. Back at Task Force Air Headquarters, Paul is shown a videotape of 13 men with moustaches. He looks at the tape twice and both times identifies face number four. It's Ivan Malat. Then, on May the 21st, detectives visit the home of Alex and Joan Malat. Alex shows them a backpack that Ivan has given to Joan. The investigators are certain that it's Simone Schmidl's backpack. This is the first hard evidence that directly links Ivan Malat to the backpacker murders. Once we had that backpack, we knew we were on the right track. We had that little bit of extra evidence and it was decided to go in. In late May, a massive force of almost 300 police mobilises to move on properties associated with the Malats. Ballistics expert Sergeant Gerard Dutton is assigned to the group targeting Ivan Malat's house. May the 22nd, 1994, from memory that I was to be one of four searches uh, to conduct a search upon Ivan Malat's house. And simultaneously, police were conducting or going to uh, carry out searches on other properties belonging to other members of the Malat family in New South Wales and Queensland. My role at Ivan Malat's house was not only to assist in the searching process, but to assess the significance of any firearms evidence that we might find there. And uh, I spent three days searching the house and uh, then I left to, to continue work back in the laboratory while the search actually uh, still carried on. But by that stage we found some very, very interesting and, and promising evidence. Ivan Malat is arrested. Police discover a mountain of evidence against him. They find a vast hoard of weapons and numerous items belonging to the victims, including Simone Schmidl's green water bottle. The name Simi has been scratched out, but can be seen when examined under infrared light. A pillowcase is found in Malat's garage. It's similar to the one seen by Paul Onions, and it contains elements of a restraining device, including sash cords stained with blood, almost certainly the blood of Carolyn Clark. A photo is found of Malat's girlfriend wearing a Benetton top, identical to one owned by Carolyn, and it's of a type that's sold in England, but not in Australia. At the home of Richard Malat, police find sleeping bags belonging to Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters, and the tent Carolyn's been given by fellow backpacker Steve Wright. Richard Malat disputes the findings to this day. It was not Carolyn Clark's tent. We identified that tent at the courthouse, not that it hers. I don't know what they found at the court, but as far as I was ever concerned, it was never her tent. But the tent has a hole repaired with computer tape, consistent with the hole that Steve Wright had made with his fruit picking knife. At the home of the Malat matriarch, Margaret, the search uncovers weapons and a crucial piece of evidence, a blue Next brand shirt belonging to Paul Onions. And there's more of the victim's property and a large amount of weapons and ammunition scattered over several other Malat properties. Some of the ammunition matches batch numbers found at two of the murder scenes. But the most incriminating discovery is found in a wall cavity in Ivan Malat's home. An officer shows it to Gerard Dutton. 
he'd recovered this bag and, and, and he looked inside and that's when he called me. And so when I went up and had a look, uh, I couldn't have been more excited because inside that bag were components of a Ruger 1022 rifle. And in particular, uh, there was the, the trigger assembly, um, uh, an aftermarket magazine. The item of most interest to me, it was a Ruger 1022 breech bolt assembly. Uh, and, I, and I was tremendously excited because that offered a real potential to marry up the marks that were left on uh, the cases in the forest um, using that particular component. But Clive Small still doesn't believe he has the smoking gun, the hard evidence to charge Malat with the seven backpacker murders. The initial warrants were uh, for both the attempted murder of Paul Onions and the belief that he might well have had, and other members of the family might well have had property um, or other evidence relating to the murders of the seven backpackers. Um, but at the end of the day when he was arrested, the charge preferred against him was against the attempted murder of Paul Onions um, because we needed time to assemble all the facts and the evidence we had relating to the other seven murders and to analyse the exhibits and property that were found on the day of the raids. The ballistics expert Gerard Dutton examines the Ruger breech bolt found in Ivan Malat's home, but only some parts of the weapon have been discovered. So back at the laboratory, I used uh, the breech bolt that we found from the wall cavity. I disassembled a, another Ruger 1022 rifle, introduced that breech bolt, reassembled the rifle, and then test fired it into our water tank. Now the whole idea of this process was the action of cycling cartridges through, through the rifle leave certain marks on the cartridge cases and in particular the face of the breech bolt will leave certain marks as does the firing pin, the extractor and so on. And it was those microscopic marks which I was able to use to identify the, this breech bolt as having been used uh, or having been fitted to the gun that was used to kill Caron Clark. And so, yeah, I, I distinctly remember the hairs on the back of my, my neck standing on end. It was a, it, it was a very uh, unique moment. On May the 31st, 1994, Ivan Malat is charged with all seven backpacker murders. I believe right up until the last day, Ivan believed that he was somehow still in control of the situation. He didn't believe that the police would ever convict him. He, I don't think he actually objected to being the centre of attention and being the person accused of these murders because I think he still thought he was in control of the situation. At the committal stage, Malat is represented by John Marsden, who doesn't mince words with his client. And I said, Ivan, if these things are true, and I'm not accusing you, but if they are true, and I can tell you the evidence is bloody strong as I've seen the evidence, then you've got a problem which is not a straight out murder problem. You've got psychiatric problems. We need to get psychiatric help and treatment and see whether you can do a compromise deal. And Ivan didn't react well to that. And the next time I went to court, I was standing up in court before the learned magistrate Flack, and Ivan just got up and said, I've sacked John Mars, he's not my solicitor. And that was the last contact I had with Ivan Malay. At the committal hearing, Simone Schmidl's father, Herbert, is asked to identify some of Simi's belongings. He takes offence when his evidence is questioned and throws his cigarette packet across the courtroom. I was in a situation which one does not experience every day. And on top of that, to sit across from the accused killer with six or seven metres distance between us, and he looks at me with a grin on his face. I don't know why I did this, but it gave me great satisfaction, throwing that cigarette packet, as I felt the defence lawyer was trying to catch me out. In any case, that grinning face of Malat will haunt me for the rest of my life. Malat is committed for trial to commence in June 1995, but proceedings are repeatedly delayed as wrangling continues over legal aid for his defence. The trial finally begins on March the 11th, 1996 at the St. James Supreme Court with Justice David Hunt presiding. The accused is represented by Barrister Terry Martin. Early in the trial, Crown Prosecutor Mark Tedeschi produces a key witness. Paul Onions was, I think he was my first witness. Uh, he was obviously 
a most important witness, uh, really I think you could say the most important witness in the prosecution case. The reason being that he was the only person who had um, uh, been the subject of an attempted abduction by Ivan and got away. And Ivan had not just Paul Onions, but all of this circumstantial evidence and forensic evidence, his, his possession of voluminous amounts of backpacking equipment which could be proven had come from these seven deceased backpackers. Uh, the ballistics evidence which showed that he was in possession of the two firearms which had been used, the blood that was found in his home that was shown to have been consistent with having come from one of the deceased backpackers. His possession of cable ties that were the same as the cable ties at one of the, one of the death scenes. Um, his possession of material identical to that which had been used in one of the other restraints on one of the other backpackers. I mean, there was an enormous amount of evidence. I might have told you, you know, less than half of it, less than a quarter of it. During the trial, Anka and Manfred Neugebauer watch Malak closely. I said to the policeman, I wanted to see in his eyes to look, uh, to look what, what happened. And then uh, he saw me, and all the time he couldn't, uh, couldn't look in my eyes. He always looked like ashamed, or I didn't his know. His down. And, and his head down. And so and afterwards, Bob Gordon say, oh, uh, he couldn't uh, look in your eyes. What, what happened? I, I think I don't know, but I think he, he was feel guilty or so. I don't know. The defense case centers around the possibility that other members of the Malat family are the killers, rather than Ivan. In his summing up, Crown Prosecutor Mark Tedeschi addresses that issue. What I said to the jury was that I, I was not able to prove definitively that Ivan had committed any of these seven offences on his own. Nor was I required to prove that he was on his own. All I had to prove beyond reasonable doubt in order for there to be a conviction was that he either did it on his own or that if it was more than one person that he was one of them. On July the 24th, the jury retires and a nation waits breathlessly for the outcome. Three days after retiring, the jury returns its verdict. Ivan Milat is guilty as charged. Deborah Everest's mother, Pat, has sat through the trial, trying to come to terms with what this man has done to her daughter. You expect to see a monster, but he was quite an ordinary looking fellow. Um, and it's still very hard to believe that a person could do that to someone else. It's, even now, I find it hard to believe that one person could deliberately set out to torture and kill someone they didn't even know just for the pleasure of it. I mean, he just must be pure evil, that man. I just can't imagine it. On May the 27th, 1996, Ivan Milat is convicted of the seven backpacker murders and the abduction and attempted murder of Paul Onions. Carolyn Clark's father, Ian, recalls the scene as the verdict is handed down. Oh, there was a tremendous amount of emotion um, and, uh, and, and relief once the verdict came. Um, and there was sort of, you know, controlled screams of delight, I think, when we got the verdict, which, um, or there were eight verdicts, in fact, and he was thankfully guilty on all of them. Um, but it was, um, it was a very emotional time. Malat is sentenced to six years in prison for the robbery and attempted abduction of Paul Onions. For the murders of the seven young backpackers, he is sent to prison for the term of his natural life. He is far from a model prisoner. He attempts to escape. 
goes on hunger strikes and swallows razor blades. Today, Malat lives separate from other prisoners in the supermax section of Goulburn Jail. He continues to protest his innocence. I think there's remnants of Ivan's control freak attitude still left with him. The reason he, uh, in my view, why he won't admit to these uh, offences was because while he doesn't admit to them, he still thinks he's got you over a barrel. The other reason, I think, is because he realises that once he admits to it, everything's gone. He's got no control. He's got no chance of getting out. He's got nothing that anyone's interested in anymore. Whatever they think privately, most of the Malat family say publicly that Ivan is innocent. If you think your brother never did it, and you think the police set him up, or mistreated, well, I just, why would, why would you think that he was guilty? Just because a policeman come and told you that he did it. Well, what was he there with him? And I had a few dealings with the police, and I wouldn't trust them. The ability of people to deny reality uh, is, is great, and, and family members can readily deny uh, that someone in their family has done wrong. I don't think that's always in their service, and I think when families would feel ashamed of what a family member had done, uh, would seem to me to be a more, a, a healthier way and perhaps better for the person who'd committed the crime. But to support someone who had committed such a crime is, is thereby endorsing the crime. But Boris Malat has broken ranks with the family. He's in no doubt about his brother Ivan. I'd like to say about Ivan is that I see Ivan as a completely evil, evil person. And, uh, and I would say that if he never got caught, he would have went on to more evil things. And to the point where he was so dangerous that he was so charming and so that he was dangerous in that alone because it would dis disarm everybody. The animosity between Boris and Ivan goes back a long way to the days when Ivan was having an affair with Boris's then wife. At one point, Boris even plans to shoot his brother, but he backs out at the last minute. And people today cannot, will not, and fail to accept people that know him that he's done this thing. I've got no problem at all with it um, because he's evil. He's just plain evil. And that's it. And there's very few people that you will come in contact in your life that is evil as this man, I can tell you now. Wally, or Walter as they know him on TV, and, and Richard both have expressed to me their horror and dismay of what he's done privately. But they won't come out in public and say it. But they say it to me. And they believe it. I can see they're hurt by what's happened. <laughs> no, 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 no. Ivan Malat's guilt is beyond doubt, his depravity beyond comprehension. But many questions remain unanswered. Did he act alone? Or was there a second person involved in at least some of the murders, as was strongly suggested at the trial? Have we got definitive proof of that? No. To my way of thinking, in, in all the years I've been doing forensic firearms casework, if you only had the one shooter there with two rifles and two boxes of ammunition, I think the likelihood would be quite high that uh, some of that ammunition would have been fired in both rifles and we would have had evidence of that, but that, that wasn't there. And so I, I would lean towards uh, guessing that there were two, two shooters at that particular lo location. At Ivan's trial, Richard Malat was closely questioned about his possible involvement. Well, on that part, that's the lawyer just saying whatever. Um, it didn't worry me one bit at all. I got more than 100 witnesses saying I'm at work six days at a time. Um, so he's got to do something, the lawyer. John Marsden believes Malat may have had an accomplice, but not one of his brothers. I don't think Ivan did it alone, and I've said it on one public record, that if any of his family were involved, his sister, who's now deceased, had a very close relationship with him. I don't think the Telegraph reported me correctly when they said I said she was involved, but if I was suspicious, 
of her knowledge at least, and if not her acquiescence, um, I would say that. But at the end of the day, yes, I think he had someone with him, but were never his brothers, never his brothers. Clive Small remains convinced that Ivan Malat acted alone. The argument that there were uh, two or more uh, offenders I don't accept, and the basis for not accepting them is the 1970s matter he committed by himself, the Paul Onions matter he committed by himself. He, uh, Ivan, had control of all of the property that was taken from the crime scenes. He was the one who handed it to friends and relatives and no one else. He was the one who gave his girlfriend um, the jumper of one of the victims, no one else. Uh, the firearm that was used was found in his place. Um, he knew the area and he had the four wheel drive to get there. So I think all of that goes towards saying is the one per it was the one person and Ivan acted alone. It comes across and they've, they say this and that and this and that, he couldn't, Ivan couldn't do all these things on his own. Believe me, he could. He could do it with one hand behind his back. Uh, Ivan could. Whether or not Ivan Malat acted alone is in the realm of speculation. But what is much more than speculation is the very real probability that Malat murdered elsewhere at other times. There are several unsolved murders and missing persons cases where Malat seems to fit the frame. During Task Force Air's investigations, an exhaustive search is made of cases from 1970 onwards. Investigators turn up 43 missing persons from 36 separate incidents and 11 unsolved murder incidents involving the killing of 16 people. They conclude that it's possible Malat was involved in up to 14 of the missing persons cases. Of the 16 murders, Malat is a prime suspect in three cases and his involvement in others cannot be ruled out. We would suspect uh, on the inquiries that were made uh, that there are probably three or four other murders uh, that Ivan is good for, but there's simply not enough evidence there to prove it. Predictably, Malat denies all knowledge of these matters and refuses to assist police with their inquiries, denying the victim's families and even his own family an opportunity for closure. Ivan Malat is a heartless predator who snuffed out the lives of young, vital, and carefree kids just for fun. I think the best thing about Ivan at the moment is the fact that he's in Supermax at Goulburn, and I think the best thing for the community is the fact that he will die there. Malat has been brought to justice, but for the parents of James, Deborah, Simone, Gabor, Anya, Carolyn, and Joanne, the agony goes on. Their children were taken from them in the most horrific circumstances. What they've had to endure and must endure for the rest of their lives is beyond comprehension. Malat has destroyed my entire life. He has completely thrown me. No one will ever know the pain I go through. An outsider has no idea what one has to cope with and how you have to experience it yourself to know what it is like to lose your only child. I feel so sorry, so, so, uh, yeah, uh, so down, really. Uh, it comes always uh, in, uh, yeah, from time to time. Uh, it, and it is still, now 15 years after this event, uh, or this accident, or this, yeah, it's uh, not, it's still worse. It's still worse, sometimes even more emotional. Even now, I wake up sometimes and think, perhaps it was just a dreadful mistake. Perhaps it wasn't her at all, you know. I don't think your brain ever really accepts the loss of a child, ever. I think, I think you do come to terms and you have, well, you have to if you're going to have any sort of life, um, but you never stop grieving. You know, life does go on, um, but, you know, Caroline is in a little special compartment of her own. And, 
you live round her, but you can always go in 